That's more streams than on a 28 core Mac Pro with Afterburner. Yes, that's right. We're hearing widespread reports today of Intel Mac Pro users throwing the computers in the trash. Now, motives are unknown at this point, but we're hearing this is especially challenging for trash can Mac Pro users who are unsure how to proceed given that their Mac was already a trash can to begin with. We'll keep you up to date with the latest reports, but for the moment, back to you in the studio. Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. And today, Apple held their October event where we finally got to see the long-awaited redesigned MacBook Pros with M1 Pro and M1 Max SOCs. And wow, did they throw everything at the wall on this one. They literally dedicated 35 minutes to the Mac and after talking up these new processors, they went ham on the new hardware design. So here are my opinions on the new M1 Pro and M1 Max MacBook Pros. <laughs> oh my, that naming. <laughs> Let's start with the processor. When they announced the M1 Pro chip during the event, they were throwing out big numbers like 10 core CPU, 16 core neural engine, 200 gigabytes per second memory bandwidth with up to seven times faster performance than that of the M1, which was already pushing well above its weight class. And on the GPU side, this was no different, claiming up to two times faster performance than the M1 and up to 32 gigabytes of unified memory. Now, at first I was slightly disappointed because it was a little short of the rumored 64 gigabytes. However, in a great infomercial moment, but wait, there's more. Because they didn't stop there. The M1 Max is the even beefier version of this chip with up to 400 gigabytes per second memory bandwidth, four times faster GPU performance than the M1 and up to 64 gigabytes of unified memory. And in comparison to the M1 Pro's two external display support, the M1 Max can support up to three 6K displays. But these are all just crazy numbers. What seriously impressed me with these chips is the dedicated section to accelerating ProRes video. We first saw this with the Afterburner card in the Mac Pro, which was a $2,000 add-on to help with this task. And this thing is massive when you compare it to the slither of space it occupies on the M1 Pro and M1 Max chips. Now, I can't say I work heaps with ProRes video. I use it a lot in post-production, but not as a capture format. Still, I find this really exciting because it not only shows Apple is focusing back on its professional customers, but it's also taking full advantage of this combination of hardware and software they have, bringing Mac Pro performance to a laptop. Now, for the sake of this not sounding like an advertisement, there are some potential downsides as Apple moves more towards its own SOCs because it now falls to Apple to keep pushing the envelope further every year. If companies like AMD or Nvidia start to push ahead, the MacBook could become a less attractive option in the future. And the second part of that is support. Apple has done a good job so far pushing companies to move their apps to become Apple Silicon native, using metal for their graphics. And thankfully, most of the big players have with DaVinci Resolve, Premiere Pro, Cinema 4D, and even Redshift. But in the future, when we eventually lose Rosetta 2, we might start to see more of a divide as companies have to weigh up how much it's worth for them to develop for the Mac. And I say this especially for 3D software, which to this point has mainly relied a lot on Nvidia and therefore has had very limited Mac support. Still, my guess is most of the people watching this video aren't 3D artists, but Apple talked up a big game for software such as Cinema 4D, which is arguably the much harder software for the Mac to run if you were to compare it to something like DaVinci Resolve, especially when rendering complex scenes. For video editing software, this thing looks like it's going to be incredibly powerful. I'm tempted to get it just to try out how one of my bigger projects will fare on this computer especially with temporal and spatial noise reduction applied in Resolve. As I showed in my previous video on the M1 Air, the computer almost ground to a halt when I tried to add it to my Sony A7S III footage. Moving on to the hardware, I was potentially a little surprised to see the design direction of the new MacBook Pros. I think we all expected this very squared off design akin to the iPhones and iPads recent design language, but instead Apple went with a much more round design at the base Harking back to the 2006 MacBook Pro before the design went to the unibody construction we know today. With the return of some old ports including MagSafe, HDMI and an SD card slot, it feels like an interesting mixture of old and new, especially because the screen is super thin in comparison to the body and also now has a notch. Yes, a notch. This is one decision that had me pinching myself during the presentation. There is so much to love about these new MacBook Pros but a notch at the top of the screen is a tough pill to swallow. I will say on macOS, it doesn't seem so bad at first because it just eats into the menu bar. 
And on an app like Finder, which a lot of the promo images show, there aren't many menu options. But on an app like DaVinci Resolve, a pro app, where the menu bar almost runs into the right side of the screen, what's gonna happen there? And also in a lot of the promo shots, the Mac is shown without the notch. Because it appears in full screen mode, the app conforms to underneath the notch, giving you a bit less screen real estate. But this definitely feels like the right choice. Honestly, this isn't a deal breaker, although I wouldn't have minded the top bezel being a bit larger to fit the camera. But otherwise, there is a lot to love here. They've removed the touch bar, to which I will not be attending the funeral, sadly. And the return of MagSafe and the SD card slot and the HDMI port are all great news for professionals. As they stated in the presentation, you can have up to three 6K displays plugged in and still charge and use an SD card at the same time. Amazing. The mini LED liquid XDR ProMotion display with up to 120 Hertz refresh rate looks super impressive. And as someone who's recently upgraded to the iPhone 13 Pro, it's jarring going back to a lower refresh rate once you've experienced it. I will say ProMotion is a bit more of a nice to have for me, especially because editing video content really needs higher than a 60 Hertz refresh rate, which thankfully you can still adjust manually. But being able to watch and potentially grade HDR content on the go sounds like an amazing proposition. And finally, battery life also seems to be very impressive with up to 11 hours of web browsing on the 14 inch and 14 hours on the 16 inch. All of this without losing any performance due to the efficiency of these chips. And I really think that's a massive selling point of these computers because with other comparable PC laptops, you really need to be plugged in to get the best performance. All of this coupled with faster SSDs, new thermal design, 1080p camera and speaker system, it all sounds pretty good. But how about the price? I suspected it in my M1 MacBook Air video, but with all these new features, this wasn't gonna be a cheap laptop. To give Apple props, the computer starts at the same price as the previous generation MacBook Pro, but quickly gets very far away from it. Especially for the 14 inch, which can now run you up to nearly 6,000 US dollars with the 16 inch topping out just over that. Now, this doesn't mean these are bad value. In fact, I would say it's just the opposite. For that price, you have a 10 core CPU, 32 core GPU, 64 gigabytes of memory, and an eight terabyte SSD. This is compared to a similar priced Mac Pro, which has an eight core CPU, 32 gigabytes of memory, eight gigabytes of graphics, and a 256 gigabyte SSD. And when you consider the MacBook Pro has a HDR screen with 120 Hertz and is portable with great battery life, it makes the Mac Pro look like a seriously bad deal. Sorry, Mac Pro, you can close your ears. The hardest part of all this will be deciding which configuration you require for your work, given these processors are so new and you really don't have much to compare them to besides the M1. Is 32 gigabytes of memory going to be enough? Should you go the 16 or 24 core GPU? I will definitely be doing more research into this once these laptops land, so make sure to subscribe if you'd like to know more. Overall, I think Apple has done a great job here. Besides the notch, which is questionable, they've delivered on everything we've been asking for. So does this mean I'm going to upgrade when I just released a video a few months back as to why I'm happy with my M1 Air? No, probably not this time. I am still really happy with my setup and a lot of what I'm doing right now is using my MacBook Air to write scripts, research, and consume content more than creating it. However, if you fall into the latter, these new MacBook Pros might definitely be for you. I would say given their insane amount of performance and features, they will hopefully be workhorses for years to come. And now we're just waiting on this new Apple Silicon Mac Pro, at which point I'll purchase a $19 polishing cloth to wipe away my tears for the fallen Intel one. Let me know your thoughts down below and throw me a like if you enjoyed the video. I've just received a Sandmark ND filter for the iPhone 13 Pro, which I'm gonna test out soon. So make sure to stay subscribed and I'll see you all in the next one.